Hello, my lovelies. Come on in and have a seat. Today, we're going to consider a question that's been on my mind lately. Is the Second U.S. Civil War imminent? I truly hope not, but the possibility seems to be looming, and even Newsweek is putting the idea forward. This video was supposed to drop last week, but I had some severe audio issues, so you're not going to see exactly what I intended. I intended for you to watch me stitch leather bracers while I talk. That didn't work out, so now you're going to watch video of me stitching leather and me standing here talking to you. These bracers are prototypes for dog training. They are not intended to train attack dogs. These are for helping young large breed dogs learn bite control. I will fully explain and demonstrate in another video. Before we go any farther, I just want to say Welcome to Cape Bonnie Country. Thank you so much for stopping by. This channel is not possible without viewer support, so please remember to like this video, subscribe and get notified, comment, and share with your friends and family. This video was intended to drop on February 16th, which is two days after Valentine's Day, so I just want to take a moment and brag on Doc Dillinger and show you my Valentine's present. Now, the cord is a little short, so you might not be able to fully see it. It's a little too short to do what I want. He brought me a lovely coffee warmer. Hopefully, my background remover doesn't remove it, but this is the coffee warmer he bought for me. I can choose the temperature that I want my coffee to be held at and how long it will run before it turns itself off. Now, I can keep my coffee in my Mandalorian mug nice and warm while I sit here and edit these videos. I thought it was a very practical gift and he did really well. Now back to the topic at hand. Is the USA going to fall into chaos and start the second US Civil War? I was scrolling my newsfeed a little over a week ago and came across this article from Newsweek. The headline reads, Civil War after Donald Trump win may be worth it, evangelical preacher. Now, I am not going to sit here and read the entire article to you. If you want to read it for yourself, the link will be in the description. This is a political topic, and I know it will get people riled up on both sides of the aisle. I would like you to know that I consider myself an independent. I am not a card-carrying member of any political party, even though the state of Alabama does not recognize independence, and we all must register as either a Democrat or a Republican for the primaries and local elections. I am not fond of either the Great Orange Man nor Captain Dementia. I am not going to disclose who I am voting for, but at this point I am considering writing in an Adam Calhoun and Dax ticket with a recommendation that they make Tom McDonald chief of staff or possibly press secretary. Anyway, Reverend Andrew Womack apparently said on his Truth and Liberty show on Wednesday, February 7th, that if Trump is elected and the Republicans take the majority in Congress, well, people around him think we are going to have another civil war. He went on to say that, and I will make sure to clip this part, blow it up real big in editing, he doesn't want a civil war, but he thinks it might just be worth it to turn this nation back. Back to what, sir? Back to good, wholesome American values where there were two parents in every home. But one of those parents might be beating the spouse and kids while society turned a blind eye. How about back to the times when companies didn't pay workers in real money? Instead, they paid using company script, which could only be used to pay the rent on your company-owned shack that you lived in and to buy items at the company store where they charged twice the going rate for household essentials like bread, milk, and eggs. This was 100% designed to make the workers indebted to the companies so that the workers could not afford to quit, move, and find another job. Essentially, it was creating wage slaves. That's what inspired the song 16 Tons by Tennessee Ernie Ford. You load 16 tons, what do you get? 
another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can go. I owe my soul to the company store. Yeah, I can't sing and I will never do that again. So how about we go back to the time when children were allowed to work in factories and mines? especially textile mills, because children were small enough to run in between the shuttles while they were running. Children died. Stephen King's The Mangler was inspired by such stories. But we have gone back far enough? Okay, then how about we go back to the time before the first Civil War? No, no one wants that? Okay, then you know it might be nice to buy 20 acres of land and build a three-bedroom house for less than 5,000 bucks. I think that's about the only thing Americans would really like to go back to. Going back is not only a bad idea, it is impossible. I think very few people would accept a world where eight-year-old children worked and died in factories and mines. No one wants a world where children are left in homes, where they are beaten bloody on the daily. And the vast majority of people will reject a world where slavery is a socially sanctioned institution. We need to move forward. That's my point. We can't seem to move forward because our elected officials have their hands over their ears while throwing tantrums like toddlers. But that's a rant for another day. Today, I'm wondering what the second U.S. Civil War would look like. The first U.S. Civil War had clear-cut geographical lines. The more populated northern states had more industries and supported policies that favored industrialization. The less populated southern agrarian states provided raw materials to the northern states. The South felt shortchanged by those policies, and their economy also relied on slavery to work. The geographical lines were quite clear, but we aren't separated by geography this time. We are separated by ideologies and economic factors. It wouldn't be a war between the states as it would be a war within the states. It would be a war between cities and communities, neighbors and families. Parents ideologically opposed to their children and siblings killing each other. It could be started by the states standing up to the federal government and saying, you have overstepped the powers that the Constitution has granted you and encroached on our constitutional rights. Now, I covered some of this in my previous video titled, Guns and the Role They Play in My Country Life. I will link that video at the end of this one. The current conflict between the state of Texas and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Citizenship and Immigration Services Division is an example of this. The U.S. Constitution gives the federal government jurisdiction over immigration and naturalization, but it also grants the states authority to protect themselves from imminent danger. As these two portions of our Constitution and our rule of law clash, U.S. citizens are taking sides. If federal agents, be that military, FBI, ICE, or whomever, open fire on American citizens, that will start a war. And if U.S. citizens open fire on federal agents, well, that's going to be a massacre. We've seen that at Ruby Ridge. We've seen that at Waco. And once again, civil war will start. We are also in a time when the economically disadvantaged and American workers are feeling the effects of unprecedented inflation. Young adults go into debt to pay for educations that do not guarantee that they will get a good paying job. Then they can't qualify for the loans needed to purchase a home because they have this huge debt hanging over their heads. 
You also have blue-collar workers that are stuck in jobs with stagnant wages and cannot afford to pay upwards of $200,000 for a new home. On top of that, affordable rent is getting harder and harder to find. Before I bought my house in 1998, I rented a trailer that was manufactured in 1990. It was located in a suburban area near a really highly rated elementary school. I paid $350 a month rent. That same exact trailer still sits on that same exact lot. It is now a 34-year-old trailer. I'm sure it's had minor repairs and remodeling since then. But they're now leasing it for 1100 a month rent. Now, Wall Street says inflation is cooling. But you can't prove that by me and my wallet. And my neighbors? Well, things aren't any better for them either. I cannot speak to what other households are experiencing. I can only tell you what I am seeing with my own two eyes. In December, my electric provider raised their rates. January came with a water rate increase and garbage pickup increases. Both my car insurance and my homeowner's insurance renew in March. And they both went up. Doc and I drive a lot less than we used to. I turned those changes in before the end of the last contract. My insurance agent told me that this brought my rates down by about $30 a month. But when my contract renewed, I saw that I'm actually going to pay $27 more. When I inquired about this, I was told that rates were going to go up across the boards. If I hadn't turned those changes in where I am driving less, my insurance would have gone up by over $100 a month. Now, all totaled, I am going to pay $138 more in the month of March than I did in the month of January. That leaves less discretionary income to buy gas for the car to conduct my business. But I don't drive a whole lot, so there's not much that I can cut there. It's less money for my entertainment budget. We don't ever go anywhere and do anything that costs money because we can't afford it. All we have is our streaming services, and that is less money for me to buy groceries with. If I cut out my streaming services, I'm still going to need about $100 a month from my grocery budget. We spent $317 on groceries for two people for the entire month of January. That is up from $263 for the entire month of October, without major changes in what we were eating. I just spent $134 for two weeks worth of groceries and the only meat I bought was one pound of sausage and one pound of bacon. We have to cut out pretty much all fresh meats and produce and go to buying frozen and canned instead. We have to grow more on our little patch of land and rely on hunting and trapping to get most of our meat now. The economically disadvantaged and working classes are becoming desperate. Over the last five years, since just before COVID started, we have seen an increase in retail theft, property climbs, ah, climbs, climbs, really? We have seen an increase in retail theft, property crimes, and violence. Good people trying to make ends meet are a little more tempted not to scan that gallon of milk at the self-checkout. People forced to choose between purchasing their life-saving medications or paying the power bill to keep the heat on, start looking at those $800 TVs in the big box stores, knowing they can resell them on the streets for $500. Out of desperation, they are more likely to work with someone to walk that TV right out the front door just so they can afford their life-saving medications. In Alabama, someone cut down a radio tower just so they could steal the copper wire out of it. And then another radio tower completely disappeared. People who have very little are more willing to defend what little they have with violence. And we have become scared of our neighbors and their motivations. Crime is a societal issue. It is a people issue. 
Now, I am not excusing these crimes. But when viewed in the context of desperation that Americans are feeling right now, they become understandable, even though they are not excusable. I don't think it's a matter of if a second civil war will begin, but a matter of when. And when it happens, it will be bloody. I'd like to thank Dr. Day, one of my history professors in college, for providing the following numbers to me. Yes, I was one of those nerds that took excellent notes in class, typed them up afterwards, and then sold them for a profit. The U.S. Civil War saw around 600 to 650,000 troop casualties. That does not include civilian numbers. The population of the USA at the time the war started was approximately 30 million people. So roughly 2% of the American population were killed in battle or died as a result of injuries sustained in battle. According to the 2020 U.S. Census, we have slightly more than 100 times the population that we did back in the days of the first Civil War. If only 2% of the U.S. population was to die due to battles in the second U.S. Civil War, we would have roughly 6.5 million dead Americans. I think the death toll will be much higher, though. I am expecting at least 10%, probably more. We are talking upwards of 33 million dead combatants. I think we will see a higher number due to the lack of clear geographical lines and established uniformed armies. Last time, civilians had time to flee ahead of the battles. Atlanta knew Sherman was coming. Civilians had time to flee before the battle got there. Now, we won't have clearly identified armies this time. Yes, there will be U.S. military troops deployed in their uniforms, but you also have U.S. military troops that desert their posts because they cannot bring themselves to fire on fellow Americans. We will not be able to tell what side somebody is on simply by what they are wearing. Your next door neighbor could be on the opposing side. Civilians will have little to no warning before violence breaks out in their neck of the woods. There will be splinter groups of militias, freedom fighters, or whatever they or the news want to call themselves running about, looting, pillaging, and killing indiscriminately. And you will see people defending their homes against whomever comes up and tries to take it from them. At that moment, the United States of America will be at our weakest point and open to foreign invasion. If the USA destabilizes, it will have global consequences. And that will be all the UN needs to send in peacekeeping forces and impose martial law. Russia is already laying claim to Alaska, saying that the deal brokered with Seward is now null and void. Russia would absolutely take that opportunity to invade and reclaim Alaska. We also have Chinese companies buying large tracts of American agricultural land and land next door to U.S. military installations. Smithfield, one of the largest producers of breakfast meats in the USA, is owned by a Chinese company. Since China is a communist country, they can nationalize every single Chinese company with a simple decree. Next thing you know, Every bit of property owned by a Chinese company in the United States of America is under direct control of the Chinese government. When the second U.S. Civil War comes, it will be bloody chaos and what rises from the ashes will not be what the Founding Fathers designed for us. We will not be the nation we are now and I don't know what will rise from those ashes. I am quite sure It will no longer be 
the land of the free and the home of the brave. So how do we avoid this? In kindergarten, we were taught to use our words and not our fists. The only way the American system works is when we all sit down like civilized adults, talk things over, and find compromises. The essence of compromise is that no one gets everything they want. But we do end up with something that everyone can live with. That means we have to stop throwing tantrums like toddlers and actually listen to the opposition in order to find common ground and things we can all live with. Now, my personal views are going to piss off a lot of people, but hear me out. For the last 60 years or so, we have had three major sources of friction in this country. Those center around equal rights for all citizens, abortion, and guns. I strongly feel that in order to preserve the nation and the Constitution, we might just have to agree to disagree and move on. The way I see this happening is a constitutional amendment that is ratified by the states that will lay these arguments to rest. First, we declare that all citizens at or over the age of majority shall be treated with the same respect and dignity under the law regardless of age, race, creed, national origin, or sexual identity. Within that amendment, you also state that all citizens above the age of majority, over 18 years old, are entitled to body autonomy. Also include that the rights of citizens granted under the U.S. Constitution shall not be infringed upon by any law or act of government. Of course, we also need to specify that children under the age of majority are under the care and direction of their legal guardians. Conservatives will have to agree not to interfere in the living rooms and doctor offices of fellow citizens and liberals will need to agree to stay out of people's gun safes you see like most of the people I know my views are in the middle between the extremes of conservatives and liberal I believe that people deserve basic human decency and respect it does not matter if you are gay or straight trans or identify as skittles you deserve human decency, respect, and autonomy. I believe that medical decisions need to be made by individuals with the guidance of their medical professionals. I also believe that no private citizen should be forced to do something that goes against their core, deeply held religious beliefs. So no medical professional should be forced to participate in an abortion if it is against their religious beliefs. And no small business owner, and when I say small business, we are talking about any business with less than 100 employees, no small business owner should be required to provide goods or services to individuals if participation would require them to go against their religious beliefs. So if a mom and pop bakery does not want to Bake a cake for your event because your event goes against their religious principles. You know, that's their prerogative. There are plenty of other bakeries that will do the job for you. I also strongly believe that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be entrenched. I believe the Founding Fathers gave us that right so that we can hunt and provide food for our families as well as defend ourselves against all threats foreign and domestic. So maybe if we can agree to stay out of everyone else's living rooms, doctor's offices, and gun safes, we can move forward onto figuring out 
how to balance the needs of the people with our capitalist economy. Because right now, those are very out of balance. You see, no one gets everything they want, but everyone gets to live. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments.